Good morning and welcome to Potato Science Live uh, series from Syngenta. Uh, today we're going to be covering soil pest management uh, with Michael Tate and Dr. Max Newbert. My name's Gus Merrick, the area manager for Syngenta, the chair for this week's series. Um, and before we get started, uh, we'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. So Syngenta is going to be uh, recording this session live. No one else has permission to record it. It'll then be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, hopefully you've got lots of questions for us. Uh, if you do, please make use of the Q&A icon. So you click on that and type your question in there and we'll do our best to answer those. Um, tomorrow you'll receive an email with a link to register for basis and neuroso points. Um, uh, and in addition to that, uh, you know, just to let you know, we can't see your faces and we can't hear you um, with regards to the recording. Um, the fun doesn't stop here today. So tomorrow we've got blight management being covered. Uh, Thursday, biostimulants in potatoes. And on Friday, covering sustainability in potatoes. Um, so I'm now going to pass over to um, Michael Tate. Yes, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Gus. Uh, my name's Michael Tate, uh, technical manager with responsibility for looking after uh, the potato portfolio. Hang on a second, let's see if I can um, share my screen here. And this morning, I'm going to cover uh, a bit of an update on soil pests. And I'm going to do that with particular reference to our long standing product, Nemethorin. And uh, later on, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Max Newbert, will be coming along to talk to you a little bit about a new lambda-based granule that we have coming into the market, hopefully in the relatively short term, and also a bit of an update on some other uh, insecticide issues relevant to the potato crop. So let's just make a start then. Um, we've got the relatively uh, short time to cover all of these things, so uh, I, will, I will press on. I think one of the first things to... Let's just see if we can get this to move. Ah, there we go. Um, one of the first things I think we need to cover is to give you a bit of an update on where we currently stand with the registration of phosphiazate and nemethorin. Uh, the situation is complicated, and I apologize in advance for this rather busy slide. Um, certainly not ideal from a presentation point of view, but there are quite a few points to try to cover uh, and this is a good aid, aid memoir for myself and also hopefully for yourselves. Now, as you're probably all aware, um, phosphiazate has, um, is the active ingredient in nemethorin. And part of the problem that we have or complexity that we have is that we've got simultaneously reviews going on as of phosphiazate as an active substance and also of the product nemethorin. Situation is also complicated by the fact that we were in the EU and now we are separate from the EU as a result of the Brexit um, changes. Now, within the EU system, um, the expiry date of phosphiazate had been moved from 2021 to 2022. And for Northern Ireland, who is still operating under EU rules, in effect, from a product registration point of view, that is still uh, in place. But of course, for GB as a whole, uh, because of the Brexit situation, we find that um, CRD, the regulators, are currently working on developing their own review program for a number of active substances, not just for thiazate, but a number of other ones as well. And recently in the potato business, we've seen one uh, consequence of that, and that was the decision that they were going to extend use of Mancozeb um, for three years in the UK. Now, um, this has also happened with uh, phosphiazate. So we've now got an extension by CRD out to um, 2024. And currently, as I understand it, the CRD website um, shows that authorization um, for us to supply it goes on until um, the end of October 23. And then there's a period for um, sale and distribution by our distributors and a kind of disposal of final stocks currently looking at around um, April 2025. 
However, it's important to note that um, within CRD, they're doing this review of the active substance, and that's not really due to be done until October 24. So it's very unlikely, it seems to us, that CRD will end authorization in 2023, and that a pro an extension is probable, shall we say. Not, we can't guarantee it, but it seems likely, bearing in mind the workload that CRD currently have in revising systems um, to cover not only this product, but also others as well. So at the moment, our best guess is that um, for Thiazate will likely remain approved until October 2024. So we have got a little bit of time um, and the loss of this product in the short term seems to us at least unlikely. I think at this point, it's very well worth highlighting the fact that the approval holders for Fosthiazate are ISK. Syngenta are the marketing um, organization, but ISK are the ones dealing directly with CRD on all of these regulatory issues. However, we do have a close dialogue with ISK and they have recently um, been providing us with quite a lot of insight into the work they're doing to try to support phosphorylate, not only within the EU, but also in GB through CRD. So CRD are well aware that um, ISK are looking to defend the product going forward. And that means beyond 2024 or 25. Obviously, however, um, it requires uh, CRD to be happy with the data that they supply. And they have been very busy in generating new studies and re-evaluating some old studies relating to fate in the environment, toxicology, etc. And a lot of that work um, has been, a lot of money has been put into that work, including both lab and what you might call desk studies. And a lot of that information has already been um, submitted to, to CRD. And there is more planned for submission at the end of April of this year. So I think you can see from this that ISK are making a serious intent um, to defend the product. Uh, clearly, they wouldn't be investing quite large sums of money to do this if they did not think there was a reasonable chance of success. And as far as we can see, that is correct. Uh, we have a, a chance of maintaining the product longer term. But obviously, all of the material that is being submitted has to be evaluated by CRD and they have to come to their conclusions based on the evidence that they're provided with. But we are hopeful that in the longer term, um, the product will be available to the industry because the product remains an important one for helping um, growers maintain yields and also to help manage PCN populations, particularly in the eastern counties of England, where a lot of potato land already has at least some infection with potato cyst nematode. So more information on this will probably become available uh, later in the year. As I mentioned a moment ago, um, this revised dossier or a supplementary dossier is going into CRD towards the end of April. And then there'll no doubt be a period of evaluation before we start to get some feedback on that. So hopefully some point later in the year or early next year, we may be in a position to um, give further clarification. But I think at the moment, uh, we as Syngenta are pretty happy. Um, we understand the, the efforts that ISK are going to both here and in the EU to defend the product longer term, and we're hopeful of a positive outcome. So on that note, I'll, I'll move on. Um, clearly, while all this is going on, it's important that um, users continue to sort of follow the nematicide stewardship um, programs best practices, uh, which means ensuring that people who are using the granules are suitably qualified, that equipment is calibrated correctly at least every two years, that when they're doing the work that they are incorporating uh, fully within a single pass, and that they have the facility to shut off um, granules at the end of runs to prevent material landing or lying on the surface where it could be um, accessed by pets or wildlife. Spillages, of course, as I'm sure you'll be aware, need to be immediately cleared away. And generally, it's important to adhere to these sort of recommendations and try not to create any situations which could adversely affect uh, the view of CRD or other regulators on the safety of the material. So 
that 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 uh, stewardship program remains in place, and we would encourage all users to follow that as closely as they possibly can. Also, probably worth mentioning, of course, that um, PCN is a, a, a big problem. Um, it's a problem which needs a multiple uh, disciplinary approach, both in terms of um, using the right varieties, uh, considering whether or not um, your rotations are appropriate, uh, where you can, considering use of other materials or other processes such as trap cropping, and of course, making the most appropriate choices with regard to nematicides. At the moment, the we're, we're fortunate with the nematorin label in that we cover the three kind of main pests, I guess, that are likely to uh, impact potato growers. Um, we have a claim for control of uh, PCN, both uh, Pallida and Rostockiensis. There's also a claim for the reduction of spraying symptoms transmitted by free living nematodes and reduction of tuber damage uh, caused by wireworms in, uh, in the soils. Now, in recent years, um, the use of nematorid has been not exclusively, but largely uh, targeted towards potatoes nematode control. Uh, use for spraying and wireworm has been more limited. Historically, people tended to use uh, oxymel vidate for spraying, and um, mocap was the, probably the first uh, or the major product used against wireworm. But of course, both those materials have unfortunately gone out of the market. Uh, so um, interest in using nematorin for these other problems has increased uh, just recently. So first of all, we Nimethorin say is a well-established long-standing product uh, dating back to the Zeneca days. Um, and there is a lot of data collected over many years to show that it's really very effective at protecting um, yield of potatoes when there are uh, problems with PCN. There's also quite a good raft of independent uh, data showing that it's pretty good at managing PCN populations, because obviously what you want to be able to do is not only protect your crop from immediate damage and yield loss, but also to try to prevent um, the buildup of the potato systematode populations. Uh, and nematorin has over the years shown itself to be um, pretty good at both those things. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an update on some newer data, um, just to sort of um, highlight that we continue to uh, work a bit in these areas, even though this product has been in the market for quite some time. So in recent times, we've had some trials with uh, SIUC or SAC in the UK, uh, both in 2016 and 2018. In 2019, we've uh, made We've had trials uh, in Holland with HLB. These were funded by ISK. And also we did some work uh, with Vegetable Consultancy Services in the UK. In 2020, um, there was more work with HLB um, funded by ISK and the same uh, in 2021. And I'm going to give a bit of a summary of these uh, data sets now just to sort of bring you up to date with how the product's looking. So this goes back to the uh, SIUC work in 2016, again showing um, very good control of the disease and protection of yield. And this is the first occasion in which we included fluopyram or vellum in our trials to get some idea of how um, vellum would compare with uh, nematorin in terms of activity against potatoes nematodes. And you can see here that we used in this early data set both of the use patterns that have subsequently become approved for, uh, for vellum, both in furrow and in bed um, application techniques. And in both of these uh, trials on two different varieties, we showed that the efficiency of uh, nematorum was greater. The same was shown. Um, to an extent in terms of the uh, control of population in both of these studies. Uh, but I think it's worth pointing out that in both these crops, we were looking at potatoes that had to be in the ground for the 119 days that are required by the PHI for nematorin. And of course, 
One of the strengths of nimethorin is that it's quite persistent in its activity against um, particularly Globodera pallida, but the downside of that is that we have a relatively long PHI. I guess if you're growing a crop where you need nematode control and it has to be um, a much shorter PHI, then um, vellum would then be an op um, a possibility. But if you're looking at a longer term crop, then I think the data that we have shows that your best option is to stick with nemethorin, both from the point of view of protecting yield and also from the point of view of uh, minimizing the uh, growth of the population of PCN. Uh, just a little bit of data from SRUC in 2018. Um, in that year, we um, also showed very good protection of yield um, compared with using uh, fluopyram on its own. And uh, again, we showed that the growth uh, in population of PCN uh, was least with nemethorin. Uh, it was gr greatest with the untreated. Uh, fluopyram had some effect, um, but the greatest effect was seen with using nemethorin. But again, we are looking at crop here that would have been in the ground for the minimum harvest period. Now, uh, vellum has also been launched in the Netherlands and our Dutch colleagues have been interested in uh, reviewing this as well. And you can see from this trial, again, good protection of yield from nemethorin relative to the untreated. And this is a trial from 2019 in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, they included here uh, vellum prime on its own. And they also included a recommendation that BCS have been quite keen on, and that is using a half rate granule uh, with the vellum prime. Now, we don't support that view of using half rate nemethorin with uh, vellum, although I know some people do use it, but the responsibility for that recommendation rests with Bayer. Uh, this uh, data set here shows the effect on population from that trial. Uh, again, you can see in the untreated quite a big increase in the number of um, eggs per gram. Nemethorin was at least able to control the population. There was very little control from vellum, and there was no obvious benefit from using Vidate uh, with vellum as a combination. Um, the best option in terms of population control from using full rate nemethorin. In the same year, uh, we ran a trial here in the UK with VCS, Vegetable Consultancy Services in the east of England. And we tried um, here again to look at this issue of using um, vellum on its own or using it is with the half rate of nemethorin. And you can see here the impact on yield. And again, the best result in terms of yield would have come from using nemethorin alone. Um, and while vellum's clearly having a benefit over untreated, it's not matching the performance of nemethorin. In 2020, the Dutch had another go at this sort of work. Um, and again, you can see here what they've done. They've um, used vellum prime at its recommended rate and with a, um, a, a low rate of Vidate in furrow here, which is a recommendation that the Dutch still use. Uh, along with the um, vellum prime. But again, you can see best protection of yield came from, um, from the nemethorin. So these are the sort of the, the data sets um, from the sort of previous period back to 2016. And you can see that in all of these cases, uh, in terms of yield protection, uh, nemethorin has proved uh, superior to uh, fluopyram. Just one study from um, the 2021 season. Um, this is from, again, from my colleagues uh, over the water, in fact, from Belgium. Um, and um, the work that shows here the site, and you can see the, um, the plots in the, in the red box. The site had a very high population of um, Globodera pallida, it also had lowish populations of Pratolenchus. Um, Melodogyne, Chetwoodii, and Trichodora species. So quite a mix of nematode species on this site, but mainly um, Globodera pallida. Again, the uh, approach was to look at um, using um, nemethorin on its own, Vidate, which has a lower approved rate um, in Belgium than we have in the UK or had in the UK, 
and also Vellum Prime. And then you've got the end there, a combination of full rate nemethorin with um, Vellum Prime. I'm not quite sure why they used the full rate rather than the half rate, but that's what they included. But you can see there that even though you, they have done that, it hasn't given a better result than using the nemethorin on its own in terms of crop growth and establishment. Uh, and you can see there that the on the untreated on the left hand side, um, the, the level of establishment of the crop was quite was obviously obviously adversely affected by uh, the nematode populations. And this just looks at the what happens to the population. The only product that actually reduced the nematode population at all um, was nemethorin. Uh, the results here are expressed uh, PCN eggs per 100 grams. So if you look at it, we normally talk about PCN per gram. So it would be about 60 uh, eggs per gram. So quite a high population. But the nemethorin has worked the best in order to reduce that. So over the years, uh, we've put a great deal of effort as a business into um, Stelisys nematode control, into understanding our product, understanding how it works compared to uh, old competitors and new competitors. Uh, and we have a pretty good data set, um, not only from the UK, but from abroad as well, that shows that um, it's extremely effective against Stelisys nematode. For various reasons, um, we do have less data um, on free living nematodes and free living nematodes in particular, the Longodorid and Trichodorid species that um, transmit tobacco rattlevirus because it's tobacco rattlevirus which is causing the sprang symptoms illustrated in the photographs below. And those of you who have got this problem because of the area you're in will probably be relatively familiar with it. But it would be true to say that until very recently, probably the product most widely used for controlling or trying to reduce the effects of spraying would have been uh, Oxymel and uh, Vidate. Our data on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on free living nematodes and spraying control is quite old, and we are going to be in the process, hopefully, of being able to update this as we go forward. But you can see here an old standard, Temic, in comparison with Nemethorin, and a, a very good level of control shown by the recommended dose rate for uh, nemethorin. So there's little doubt that it will give a reduction um, in spraying symptoms when used. And from a commercial point of view and feedback commercially, it's certainly equal in terms of efficacy to Oxymil, but um, historically, I think Oxymil was less expensive to use. So it tended to be the commercial choice rather than the technical choice uh, in terms of efficacy, why people use the Oxymil. The other um, damaging pest and a pest which frankly is likely to become more of a problem as we go forward is going to be wireworm. Now in the past, um, we did quite a lot of work uh, with Bill Parker when he worked with ADAS on looking at wireworm, looking at pheromone trapping. Um, but we found that in practical terms, many people chose to use mocap yeah, for wireworm control rather than nemethorin. So our data set for nemethorin is a little older, although my colleague uh, Max Newbert will show you some newer data uh, shortly. It's also true to say that because not much research has been done on wireworms recently, um, it's not completely sure whether or not we've got any new species that are going to be coming in and becoming a problem that we weren't previously aware of. And the big agricultural changes that we're seeing, for example, uh, the loss of the neonics, uh, which undoubtedly had a big effect on wireworms, and also the growth of more green cover crops may well also encourage uh, wireworm problems. So it's certainly something to watch out for in the future. In terms of nemethorin data, our data is, is fairly old. Uh, we have comparisons here um, with mocap, uh, which was the kind of historic standard. And generally it was regarded that they were pretty similar in terms of activity in reducing damage from wireworm, but um, commercially mocap at the time was the, the cheaper of the kind of the options. So now that uh, mocap is no longer available, there's clearly going to be a need for um, uh, alternative materials. And that's where I want to leave it, my part of the talk, and to pass over to my colleague, uh, Max Dubert, 
to inform you a bit about the new material that we hopefully have coming through uh, in, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, yes, I'm Max Newbert. So for Syngenta, I'm the technical manager to cover insect size across all crops. And as Michael suggested, what I'm going to be talking about today is a new lambda granule we're bringing in. Um, hopefully 2023 will be uh, in use, so next year. Um, we've talked about this in previous years, so there's been uh, a few developments since then. So I'm going to share a bit of data on efficacy, safety, an application and just at the end also we've got a finicabit product registered which obviously has a potato label so i'll just have a few comments about that at the end and as mike's also said uh, we'll be taking questions put them into the q a function and we'll answer them at the end but just start with the lambda granule um, it is a low density lambda granule 0.4 percent of lambda sahalathrin um, and it will come in 2023 and the crops on the label will be potato and maize and the target will be wireworm. Um, we will get it in, as you can see on the right hand side, 10 kilo S packs. Now this was a compromise. Part of, of getting this through has been the packaging to uh, have to, you know, transparency. This is a, a third party product we are then bringing to the country, a bit like Nemflora and ISK, we're bringing this in from Oxon. And we wanted to have better and more robust packaging uh, than it was originally offered in. So this, this is the compromise. It wasn't quite the um, closed transfer system we envisaged, but it will allow uh, good storage of the product uh, and minimal exposure. And also we need to have tight seals if the partial packs are used. Um, the rate will be a flat 15 kilos a hectare rate, offering about 60 grams of the AI per hectare. And it will be a, a planting soil treatment. So this will be in furrow on the label. Um, but as I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation, uh, we are going to come to the market with some advice of all the different forms you can apply in, which would allow it to be label compliant. This is just one application. Um, so no late season sign injection or anything like that. And the other thing just to say is at the moment, obviously this needs to be confirmed with CRD. It doesn't look like for pay series, there's going to be any buffer zones or post harvest interval that's been indicated. So uh, we're not going to have that long uh, PHI like we do with Nemethor and with the product. That being said, we know that we have uh, good stability of the product so it will have good long term effect uh, for reducing wild worm damage. Just to talk a bit about the granule. Um, you can see what the granule looks like compared to the other products that's been on the market. These are size appropriate. So similar sizes and what we've had uh, in trials for this year, both uh, in uh, different types of machinery is that it, it flows very well. Um, it's relatively homogeneous in the size. We know it doesn't produce dust and also doesn't get affected by temperature or moisture uh, as such. That's why we're, we're getting quite reliable applications. And so this allows us to have very good regular flow through the machine we've been using, uh, which has been a wide range of different um, application devices. So just talk about the results. Um, we, we've got quite a few results from our, uh, a bit like Michael, from our European colleagues who've had more time with the, the product. Uh, and I've got a couple of summary slides from uh, France and Austria, starting with Austria. This is a summary of two, two trials. Now, if you think back, I haven't got mocap um, in my slides because mocap wasn't widely available uh, in the European work. Um, but we have Nemo 4 and as a standard, and if you remember, Nemo 4 relatively similar to mocap in efficacy, and obviously per trial efficacy can change. But what we have here is a table just showing what class we have of potato from the trial from these different applications. Obviously, there was the untreated, the lambda granule at 15 kilos, and then number four, and at a slightly higher rate, 20 kilos rather than 15 suggested for wireworm. And you have your uh, absolutely uh, pristine class one, and then we go down the classes with more and more damage. And as you can see, we've overall got better classes from um, using the crotty granule, even up and above number four in, in this trial. And as you can imagine, for the price point, this is going to suit much more the wireworm market and will only be targeting wireworm for uh, potato crops. Now, if we move to France, this is a summary of four trials. So we have the untreated number four at 15 kilos this time, and then obviously the lambda granule at 15 kilos. Each of the four trials damage summary is uh, in the individual points from the different regions. And then you can also see what the average is. So again, it's done a very good job at reducing the number of tubers with um, obviously damage over that 3.5 mil. 
So it's offering good levels of reduction. Uh, we've had relatively consistent um, results, and this is from a variety of different application techniques, either through infra or pepper potted on for trials type systems, where it's a, a bed broadcast and incorporation. Uh, so we're getting good levels of reduction. Again, obviously not control. Uh, it's difficult to offer a product that would offer full control for wild one, but we're definitely getting reductions in damage. We have been doing trials in the UK, um, but as of yet, the trial sites we've had, we've had very limited efficacy data because the damage has been too low. What we have been majoring on the UK was to make sure this product was safe for our, our environment, our soils and our varieties. So I'm just going to show what we showed a year or two ago. Um, we did some work both with product solutions and VCS on product safety. But I'm just going to show VCS because it summarises basically the two trials. And what we were looking at was both um, crop safety and just emergence, um, where we were looking at a range of varieties. Maris Piper will be in blue. And then we've got Maris Pier in sort of pink to red and burgundy colours. A steamer in sort of the green shades. And then we've got Lady Rosetta in the oranges. Now, I'm going to put each line on top of each other. And what we'll do for each colour, it will be the untreated first and the lightest colour. We'll then go for the, the, the label rate, which will be about 15 kilos. And then I'll finally put on that one and a half times rate. Now, this one and a half times rate is obviously not label rate or something we condone. This is a safety trial. And we wanted to make sure if accidental overdosing happened because of a bit of a variation in application rate across the field, we weren't going to cause any phyto effect by this new product. It could be a high value crop. We want to make sure the product not only works well, but also has the safety needed to have good efficacy uh, to a good standard. So if we start with Maris Piper, you can see what the emergence is from uh, May up until June across the board. So obviously we're starting at the sort of 50% and working our way up to 100. And then we overlay that full rate and that one and a half times rate. So no issues absolutely at all with the Maris Piper. Moving on to the Maris Pier, so the entries emerging a little bit faster than the Maris Piper. Then we add in the other products and if anything, they're slightly faster at emerging. So no problems with efficacy or safety there. Then moving on to the steamer, again, the untreated, starting at just under 40%. And then if we overlay the one, one and a half times things, more or less bang on that line, no issues again. And if we then look at the Lady Rosetta up here, we're starting at a sort of 85% rate of emergence, a little bit lower there, but then higher with the one and a half times rate. So that's all noise within the, the trial. So very safe from an emergence point of view. Uh, and there was no phyto detected at all during the course of this trial, which was fantastic. And just continuing that, we also do a ground cover percentage, so not just emergence, but now obviously looking from the end of May all the way into the start of July. Again, we're going to do a similar look where we're starting low ground cover working up through the season. And we can see when we go through the full rate and then one and a half dollar rate for Maris Piper, again, no problems with ground cover. It emerges and establishes very well. Then moving on to Pier. No issues at all when we go up to that one and a half times rate and then the steamer fitting between the two lines. If anything, slightly faster uh, ground cover again. So safety there is very good. And then looking at Lady Rosetta at the end there. All overlay very good, very well, getting good levels of overall ground cover. So from our FC data we've got from our colleagues um, overseas, it's looking very good. You know, we've had a little bit of um, damage in the trials. It's, it's been very, very low, but the numbers sort of line up to that 30, 40% reduction, maybe a little bit more in certain situations in damage. We've got a very safe product. It's going to match probably the price point for this sector of the industry. So that's looking good. And we're hoping for that 2023 um, use case. So that'll be registered hopefully in time for the season. So that's looking good as well. So this is offering another alternative to wild world control for the industry. Obviously, it'll be coming in maize as well. Uh, and that could be probably applied in a um, fertilizer granule application at time of drilling. So from our point of view, Michael's gone through Nemothorian. Uh, you know, it's very clear that Nemothorian still is the best solution for wild worm, uh, sorry, for nematode control and sprang, uh, consequently. So that's the product for that. And going forward, you can imagine moving away from that 15 kilo rate for Nemothorian for wild worm control, we'll switch to 15 kilos of the Lambda granule uh, coded A21. 765A. Um, it's not 100% solution, as none exists for wild worm, but it definitely offers, offers a better quality uh, harvest at the end of the season, which is really good. We know it's persistent in the soil uh, to offer good control through the season of wild worm. Very stable. Uh, should it also say the granule is based on gypsum.
Now, I've talked about this in the past, uh, and this, this is going to be evolving over this year when we do some trials, looking at the different ways we can apply. Uh, but we're currently in conversation with Oxon and our regulatory colleagues about um, what application techniques will be in line with the, with the label. So most of the work in Europe um, has been in-field application. They do a fishtail application uh, down the spout between the discs uh, when the furrow is made for planting, and they apply the granule into the slot as it be made. The diffuser or fishtail just used to allow the granule to go on the sides of the furrow a little bit. So then when it's incorporated and closed up, we have a good profile incorporation of that granule so we get good wild worm control up and down the profile. It, but in all the trials we've shown, they also have a combination of, of the trial um, efficacy, looking at pepper pot on top of the surface and incorporating when planting is happening. Um, so the, the range of results has been from all those different forms and they offer plus and minuses in, in both. Now, in the past, we've been talking about the in furrow and that will be obviously very applicable. But when you read the label, this is the proposed label coming through, we have to incorporate this product completely into the soil in one operation at planting. So that means we can't leave anything on the surface. The other simulation is that it can't be broadcast to the overall soil surface um, and then incorporated. However, talking to Oxon, our regulatory colleagues, it looks like you know we could do a nemthorin type application where you would do it to the bed, incorporate it into the bed as, as planting is occurring, as long as that's all in one pass. So both will be applicable. And what we're going to come to the market and what the focus for this year is to uh, look at different application techniques and give a guide very much um, like the old nematicide guys of what application techniques you use, what machinery and, and when the granule gets applied and how and how to incorporate it. But it's very much going to be what Michael was saying at the start, you know, following very similar stewardship rules to uh, nematicide granule application. It will be under the same sort of uh, certification uh, P4G uh, type uh, applications. So it will be very similar to that, but when it comes to market, we'll have that advice, and that's that's getting signed off now by Oxon and our colleagues internally, and then we'll have more information coming out. And the plus and minuses for the sort of more infrared or uh, bed incorporation is, with bed incorporation, you're going to get wider uh, spread of the AI, which allows more bake points because there is a little bit of lateralization from this product, but most of it will be done by contact. So you want good spread, and then that will allow protection of the doors to tubers. So you'll get a better spread of control. Um, in furrow will allow a higher concentration and a lower dilution, but it's going to be very much more around the mother tuber and less protection of the outer daughter tubers. But the concentration will be higher. You have a little bit better uh, volatilization in that area of soil of the product and better control. And it looks like uh, both are pretty equivalent in efficacy. When we've done trials in both forms, we're getting similar levels of control when we've had damage. So they have plus and minuses. It's more about making sure that the incorporation is good of each application techniques to get the best out of them. But we'll come some more advice when uh, registration has occurred and we have done some more further work this year. So that's, that's Lambda Granules. Uh, so if there's any questions, do feed them in on that. The final bit I'm going to finish on is just um, a Finto. Uh, it's not going to take too long because a Finto is a product we did register last year. Um, but will be on the market this year. And Afinto is, as you see on screen, a flunicomid type product. This is a um, registration of a Topeki like product. So it's the same formulation, same grammage, and same label. Um, we do not have the same emus. But we're hoping to get those uh, further down the line. But this is a global deal uh, that Syngenta's made to get access to flunicomid. So we have it now as a straight for our market. Um, to be clear, this is not taking it away from Belgium. This is, we're going to be co marketing this on the market. So there'll be both Topeki and a Finto on the market, um, but we'll be obviously now it's in our uh, internal resource, we're gonna be looking at how to support it and how maybe to expand its use and uh, information around the product. But that does come with some uh, information and changes that's coming out because obviously now there's multiple Flanicomid products on the market. So on the label, this, this is a label very similar to um, what Topeki has, but we've got some stipulations, uh, which I'll go into in the next slide. But overall, we've got the, the carbon copy of the label, carbon copy of the product as Belgium, um, but obviously we'll look to expand it. But some things I clear very clear on, they want us to come to the market and have stewardship around, is there some things they want us to be in line with Europe with, and I'll, I'll get on to where that comes from. But overall, there's a few stipulations. So max number of applications goes across um, labels. So, you know, for instance, uh, potatoes or, or um, 
sugar beets, for instance. Sugar beet can only have one application of a finto or tapiki, not one of each, and the same for potatoes. You also know in the potatoes we've got a, a bracket where. Now this, this stems from the next slide, which is where we're trying to have ISK wants the European market to align on stipulations around a finto. Uh, I think the, the market's aware of the issues we have with uh, flanicamid and MRL exceedances. And this is down to a metabolite. Once the flanicamid is broken down by the plant, it is flow and systemic and can build up in the tuber and then gets uh, caught on the MRLs when they are looked into. Now, uh, not necessarily an issue, but it exceeds the MRL number. ISK is currently doing work to alleviate this issue, but I have not got oversight of when that will be. So for the time being, it is difficult to know if MRLs are going to be exceeded or not. There is some guidance, and, and it's on the slide, which is on the European label, but not ours, where there's some offering of ability to try and reduce uh, exceedances, which is last applications either grow stage 55, or you have a 70-day uh, post-harvest interval, whatever comes first and not to apply as a uh, mixture with oils because that would increase penetration, faster absorption of the products and then more MRL buildup. Now the, the, the wear issue is because in the European market they are doing trading of seed potatoes, MRLs checks in the seed potatoes as well, this is not similar to our market and they're more likely to uh, exceed them so seed is not supported on the continent. Now all these stipulations are revised in stewardship uh, they're not legally binding in the UK, as I'll show with the, this slide, which is just a breakdown of our label and, and the European label. So on the on the top is the Irish label. So obviously we've got registered in Ireland and the other European countries. And I've just I've just taken snippets out of the labels for these potato instances. So a lot of this information that we're talking about for the UK is based on the European to try and make us aligned. Where on the European label themselves, they have it in writing that it's where only. Um, and they've got the stipulation around the last application timing. They have it in writing not to use on seed potatoes, and they have do not use a mixture of oil-based uh, products on wear potatoes. And the maximum number of applications is based on the flunicamid uh, rather than just the product name, you know, per uh, agricultural season. Now, when you look at the UK label, it is clear that this is not legally binding uh, for us because the labels don't stipulate these uh, uh, propositions. We have potatoes, so legally it can be used on seed. Um, we have a post harvest interval of 14 days. We have you know, observations to have gaps between applications, not to use an all adjuvant when used on wet potatoes and other crops. So that is there. Um, and not to have two affinto sprays per crop, uh, for instance, in the, in the potato section. Now, for us, that means legally binding. It's not legally binding. You have to swap between a Finto and um, Topeki like it is on the continent. However, ISK has asked us to bring the message we want alignment with the European. Uh, and, and it is good to have this conversation because in the case of Planicomid, if an emirate exceedance is occurring, um, we can refer the complaint to ISK, but the likelihood is that's not... Um, legally binding problem for us or ISK, we can look into it, but it's all about application and that the support for potatoes is difficult based on that. Efficacy wise not, but MRL exceedances could happen. Uh, hence for all potatoes, there is the chance that MRL exceedances could occur even with all these stipulations above. But that's why our messages have been, what they have been in the market around where only, um, you know, you can't have one application of flamicamid as in a finto and tapiki, in sugar beet, for instance, or four, if we talk about potatoes, and this information around last application dose. This is more stewardship advice to help avoidances. Now, in the long term, hopefully we'll have a um, data set from ISK to alleviate the MRL issue, but going forward, I'm not sure when that will occur. So applications this season before that's announced uh, could be risky because if it doesn't come through in time for harvest, then there could be the potential of exceedances. So it's a bit complicated, but we're, we're going to produce some information that we can send out to make this clearer. Obviously, there's a slide here that makes it clear where this information is coming from and why we're trying to align. Um, but that's just some information about this season's use of the Finto in potatoes. And with that, I'll hand back to Gus to do the Q&A section. Thank you very much, everybody.
Okay, thank you very much, Max and Michael, for fantastic presentations um, on the, on those subjects. Um, if anyone does have questions, please send them through. Uh, chances are other people will be thinking of them. Um, okay, so to start off um, with you, Max, um, any other pests controlled by A21765A, uh, incidentally? Uh, yeah, I incidentally, it's, it's more for... Um the European market, they will have some of the beetle pests, you know, the root borer type pests will be controlled. You know, some people have asked about leather jackets, uh, potentially any surface dwelling. Uh, the potential of that is probably minimal because if they're on the surface and if the labels followed for incorporation will need to happen. Um, we are potentially looking at it to expand in the veg once registered and it might have some efficacy on fly pests. So if you think about the seed flies, um, however, that being said, we are looking at other granular options, which would be better for that, but it, it, is, a, it is a fallback. Um, and I think they're probably the other options, but really for the short term, for the next couple of years, it is a wireworm product primarily rather than anything else. Great. Okay. Uh, another one for you. Is there any, is there a data package on maize that's available for people to, to? Yes, there is. So. Uh, for the maze, I, I can dig it out and show it now. The, the maze is we've got a large data set, I think of over 30 trials in the in the UK. Um, and basically it's better than what Fireclopid was um, as a product. So as such, um, I think it's it is a really good product. The persistency is good over the long term, initial knockdown is good. Um, and it's a bit easier, Maze. The, the main thing in Maze is to make sure when you're doing applications is that you're really getting up and down the slots as you're drilling um, so that you're doing early and late um, wireworm attack control, i.e. you're getting it when the seeds germinating and then when, when the um, cotyledons are coming up um, and they're exposed to late wireworm attack. So I'll just try and find that information. Okay, I'll, I'll ask Michael a question whilst you're doing that then. Um, Michael, so uh, loss of Vidate, um, are uh, many of the problems that affected Vida also going to affect re-registration of Nemethorin, or are there some differences there? Well, I couldn't really comment on the problems that relate to Oxymil and Vida with any great authority, because some only hear them, as most people do, through hearsay rather than direct knowledge. All I can say is that some of this, those issues relating to sort of fate of products in the environment, um, fate in water, potential effects on wildlife and things are issues that ISK as the reg uh, regulatory holders are well aware of and they have developed data sets which they believe uh, address those points to a modern standard. Now, whether the regulators will agree with that, we obviously have to wait and see, but um, we, we certainly, or ISK certainly feel that they're aware of the problems and the data that they have available, uh, they believe will address those to the satisfaction of the regulators. So I think, I think that's about as much as I can say on it because I don't have sort of first-hand sight of, um, you know, all the VIDA issues. Okay. Another one for you, Michael. Um, on the subject of stewardship of Nemethorin, has anything been done about the packaging, which has sometimes been an issue? Um, Yes, we are in the process of investigating what we believe will be um, some new packaging. It will still be closed transfer, but hopefully it will get around some of the problems relating to stacking rings. But I think that's action in process at the moment. And I, I'm not 100% sure whether uh, it will all be ready um, shortly. I, I'm not sure of the exact timelines of when that new packaging will be available, but I believe it's planned for, for very soon. Brilliant. Um, Max, whilst you're doing that, could you comment on uh, the thresholds for using the uh, wireworm product in the future? Well, the, the, the thresholds will be as standard as they are, um, but it is a good question. Um, I mean, for us, we, we imagine it will be in areas that have had previous risk and there'll be high levels of um, adult activity, or you're coming out of grass lays, uh, you're on continuum maze, or you've got... Um, switching from high wireworm problems into potatoes. Um, but it's a good question. We'll have some information on that, where to use and where 
where the thresholds are, um, because at the moment I don't have um, a breakdown on that, but it is a very good point. Um, but just just on that, Gus, I've just dug out the information I thought I'd show on, on the maize piece, which obviously it is potatoes uh, science live, but the question has been asked on maize. So this, this is the data package we have from our French colleagues. So over several years, about 34 trials, and this is looking at obviously a seed treatment versus a granule, um, but thiocloprid versus the lambda granule. And I think it's quite clear to see over several assessment points. So we're going all the way sort of to the 10 leaf mark from um, just after emergence, what the level of efficacy is. So I think the average, I think I've got it in here, the average control was around, um, average damage, sorry, was about 30% plant loss across these trials. Um, but you can see the initial knockdown, extremely high. And where we're looking at then long-term control, we're looking at 80% reduction in damage. Obviously, these were put in high-pressure scenarios. So it's, it's a very good product. I think it will have slightly higher efficacy in maize, mainly because you're doing uh, you're having to cover less area. That dilution effect is there. Um, obviously, you're always going to have that with a sort of granular product in soil, but you're doing more band application right around the root system. And then obviously, once the crop's already established, damage from this pest will go down. But you can see from this, the persistency is good and the overall um, efficacy is very high. So the maize, I think, it is a um, even stronger product for levels of control because you can, if you think back to what we were looking at for potatoes, we were at more of sort of 40, 50% control, whereas we're up at the 80% for the maize. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that. Um, so just a, just a comment on the packaging. Uh, Caroline, one of our technical um, uh, AIDS has come in and said that the new packaging is being trialled this season to be put to the market in 2023. So hopefully that helps. Um, okay, so that concludes uh, the Q&A uh, part of the talk. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Thank you again to our speakers, Max and Michael. Fantastic. Um, information on how to apply for basis and Neuroso points will be sent out uh, in a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, and you know, very much uh, hope you enjoyed today's session and uh, look forward to seeing people tomorrow for blight management and later in the week for biostimulants and sustainability. So thank you very much for joining today. Thank you, then. Cheerio. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye.